my the arsehole for punching my mother-in-law in the face. Story time. Me and Steve have been together for eight years and last month I gave birth to our first child. So before I got pregnant, I was really, really close to my mother-in-law who we'll call Sandra. And I'm not entirely sure what's happened to her since I got pregnant, but she just now hates me. As soon as she found out, she got really, really clingy of my husband, Steve. And I even found out that she had been saying really nasty stuff behind my back. Apparently she said that she wasn't excited for the birth of her first grandchild. Honey. So I spoke to Steve and he spoke to his mom and he basically told her that if she doesn't snap out of it, he will go no contact with her. And roughly seven months into the pregnancy, she did start to change. About time. So last week we had a family dinner. There was my sister, my brother-in-law, her kids and my mum. So Steve did all the cooking, he prepared all the food. And just as we were about to sit down for dinner, my baby got really, really fussy. So I went to feed her and the rest of them started to eat. Steve's niece said after the meal that she was still really, really hungry and that she wanted more food. So Steve offered to make her something else. So my niece declined and Steve just went outside to have a cigarette. So once my daughter was all settled, I came back in and I came back to like an empty seat at the table. The plate had gone and Steve had already put out my plate by the time I left. And that was when I saw my niece with a full plate of food. So my mother-in-law had given my niece my food. And at this point, I was so disrespected. She was in my own house and she'd already been chatting a little bollocks the whole time anyway. So we started having this raging argument. And that was when Steve came back in. I walk over to her because I was, oh my God, I was getting in her face. She then slapped my belly and said, well, you could do with not eating so much considering you could lose a few pounds anyway. Bear in mind, I've just given birth. And I just whammed that woman straight in the face. She fell straight to the floor. I feel like I might have even knocked her out for a second. And this is when Steve shocked me. Steve screamed at everyone and said that he was sick of all of this and told everyone to get out. So I watched them all walk out the room and he turns to me and goes, and you? I was absolutely hot broken. Like I packed up mine and my baby's stuff and I walked out of our house. So over the next few days, Steve was texting me, telling me how shocked and overwhelmed he was and that he just needed a bit of time and space, but he did want me to come home and I ignored him. So I was absolutely baffled by Steve's behaviour. No man will ever get to treat me and my daughter that way. Tomorrow, it'll have been about two weeks since I moved out. And tomorrow, I'm going back to the house to serve him divorce papers. The time apart has made me realise that there is no fix for this and I don't deserve to be treated like this. And I sure as hell won't be letting my daughter be treated like this either. So what do you think? Am I in the wrong here? My boyfriend confessed that he's bi. What should I do? His boyfriend has always been a little bit femme. A little backstory on how we met. We go to the same college and we ended up in the same class. To be completely honest and frank, I thought he was gay from the moment I met him. And because I thought he was, I allowed myself to become his friend. You see, at this point in my life, every time I try to have a friendship with a guy, he would always just try to hit on me. Therefore, I could not trust a guy to be my friend. But my boyfriend, let's call him Ben. Ben was different. He was gentle and very sensitive. Now look, I didn't ask him, are you gay? But several other people in my class and I thought that he was. One night, a bunch of us went over to a friend's house up being kind of a party people showed up from another college there was about 20 of us at this get together two hours into the night i look over in a corner and there is ben making out with a girl so at this point it's confirmed that he is not gay after a couple of months of friendship i decided to confess that i thought he was gay the whole time that's when he laughed and said that's crazy because i've had a crush on you ever since i met you because we're friends i don't want to jeopardize anything between us then he kissed me i was confused and i didn't know how to respond to him so i just said thank you and thank you for letting me know we both laughed and after that we just kept our friendship going that's when i realized i started catching feelings for him. One night I decided to shoot my shot, told him I thought he was cute, and after that we made it official. We were in a fully committed relationship. Fast forward a year, things got weird. I had a new lab partner, let's name him Chad. Chad was really, really good looking. Of course, I was in a fully committed relationship. I was totally in love and head over heels for Ben. Also, Chad had a girlfriend, and he was just very respectful. Chad and I had to get together to finish a project. I told Ben that I was going to go to Chad's. That's when Ben blew up. He freaked out and told me that I should never go to a random guy's apartment. His behavior was completely bizarre. He was jealous. He had never behaved like that before. He asked me to keep my contact with Chad to a minimum, which is practically impossible since our professor put us together for this project. We were stuck together for the rest of the semester. After that, Ben was always in a bad mood. Anything I would say would set him off. He always had this like stinky girl attitude. Finally confronted him and asked him why he was always in a bad mood and acting like a stinky bitch. That's when he confessed that he might be attracted to boys that he thinks he might be bi this was soul crushing to me i felt absolutely gutted so this not only means that girls are my competition but also guys I started to cry when he told me this but i didn't want him to think that i was freaking out so i told him that it was okay and that we could talk about it some other time then he said i have to say something else he confessed that he had a crush on chad but the reason he got angry that i was going to go to chad's is because he's jealous that i'm hanging out with chad and he's not hanging out with chad the whole time i thought he was jealous because i'm his girlfriend but no then he told me he had a crush on three 
three other guys in our year and one that was above us. I couldn't help it and I asked him if he was still attracted to me. That's when he told me that I was disgusting for trying to make it all about me. He even called me a narcissist. Then he gave me the cold shoulder for three days. When I was finally able to get him on the phone, he told me that he was just confused. Then he asked me if I could stay away from Chad. This is when I went crazy on him. I told him that him confessing all of those things to me and not even considering how I might feel is terrible and that he was the narcissistic one. He apologized and asked me if we could try to work things out. Later that day, I'm in class sitting next to Chad and I'm trembling and crying. Turns to me and says, are you okay? Then he takes me outside of class to just take a breather. And I told him everything that was happening with my boyfriend, except for the part that my boyfriend has a crush on him. Chad was so nice about it. He said that I should just take my time and give him the space to breathe. But then something else happens. Chad and I finish one of our projects. That's when he says to me that he actually can't be my friend because he's attracted to me. And he told me that basically we shouldn't speak anymore because he's got a girlfriend and what he feels for me is wrong. I was confused. At this point, I was barely attracted to my own boyfriend after finding out he's bi. Does that make me a bad person? I don't know. I want my boyfriend to be mine. Then I started getting feelings for Chad. He's always been extremely handsome and very considerate and kind. He was the only person that tried to help me out when I was hurting, but he did ask me not to speak to him anymore. I have nobody to talk to. My boyfriend asked me for space. And of course I said yes. Two nights ago, I found out that he hooked up with somebody else. He's a liar. I'm planning on speaking to Chad soon. Give me your advice. What should I say? So my boss opened a credit card in my name and did the same thing to two co-workers. As if being underpaid at my job isn't enough, I just found out that my boss opened up a credit card in my name. I work at a mom and pop type business in graphic design and my boss is the same guy who hired me. Two days ago, I got a call from Capital One asking about unusual charges on my credit card. The rep went over a couple of charges and I had literally no idea what she was talking about. I told them it looked like those charges weren't on my app, and the rep said she tried calling it a different phone number, but it was disconnected. She confirmed I had two credit cards through them, but I only have one. The rep told me my other account, my actual account, had no strange charges, but a different one, opened only in December, was nearing its credit limit, and there were two large charges at different Walmart stores. I asked for the address on the account, and one was mine. The other, which I had no idea about, was the home address for my boss. They canceled the card and said I might get contacted by their fraud department. Yesterday, I told my team about it, and two of them immediately chimed up that they had their identity stolen last month with credit cards opened up in their name. The boss, who works remotely, told about a dozen of us at the end of no November that we needed to fill out updated W-9s because the company was moving to a new system and send them to him. One of them ran home on lunch and grabbed the letter they were sent from the credit card company. The phone number is one number off of our boss's cell phone number, and the address is to a UPS store in the town where he lives. I've put up with a lot working here, but this is absolutely the last straw. The work environment is middling at best, but the pay is horrible. I'm calling in sick today and starting to look for something else that actually works for me and pays at least what I'm worth. What else should I be doing other than calling the cops? Okay, update one. My company put the manager on unpaid leave a couple of days after they were contacted by a detective about the open cards. Four of us ended up filing police reports on the same day. A couple days later, I got an alert from the credit monitoring company saying someone tried opening a Discover card in my name. They put a stop to that. Still freaking doing it after people found out? One of my coworkers got a call back from the detective on Tuesday and told him a judge signed off on a warrant for identity theft. I forget the exact term for the criminal complaint last week. Apparently, the detective was able to get video footage from a store of our boss using a credit card registered in the coworker's name. Our boss also drove a car registered to him and from the store, all visible on surveillance. The detective said the sheriff's department or state's attorney department made sure to include the boss's state in the extradition limits for the warrant. My coworker said the reason the detective called was because the detective was called by another detective in the city where our boss lives. Cops in that city have tried pulling him over three times in the last month, with the last time being on Monday. All three times, he just doesn't stop. The place has a zero pursuit policy, so they have to let him go, and they think he might be armed. The house where he is supposed to be living is emptied out as well. The detective from my city told my coworker he's still waiting on other surveillance footage in regards to the rest of the complaints, including mine, and they'll likely be added on as additional counts, but they want to get him into custody first. From what it sounds like, he'd have to go through the system on his felony, a looting charge first. Then it could be extradited here to see a judge about the identity theft. Wow. Uh, edit, I followed the advice from this post. Comments, uh, OP references here. You need to tell all of your coworkers to check their credit immediately. You're also going to want to call the police like today. If he did... If he did it to you and a couple of others, my guess is he's probably doing it to every single person who sent him that W-9. I'd take a couple of immediate steps if I were you. Get a police report, 
because if the credit card companies think you might be lying, they'll do what they can to screw you over. Start a credit monitoring service like this one and check your credit. If he's opening one credit card in your name, he might have opened several. Freeze your credit so that he can't do any more damage. You said you work for a small company. I don't know if you have an HR department, but that would be my next stop. If you don't, time to hit up the owners, but don't tell them you're about to leave. Update 2. Final update. I had mostly forgotten about this post until a few days ago. Wouldn't say it was a happy ending. The silver lining is that it only took about three weeks and the card that wasn't mine was out of my name. My credit score went up like 90 points. I also started a new job with a decent pay bump and far more time off. A couple of months ago, my old boss, who was fired, ended up getting unalived in a car accident. But a day later, it came out that he had most likely unalived an elderly woman and stole her car. Her daughter went to her house, and when she didn't answer the phone and found her mother uh, unalive and her car and purse missing, his car was parked on the street a block away. Apparently, he fled police stops another three or four times before crashing into a metal electric pole with no seatbelt. He was fleeing from the police again in the stolen car. They found illegal substances and a pew-pew inside. I got a call from a lawyer because I was one of the ones who reported the credit card fraud. We talked for maybe 10 minutes about what happened to me, and he filled me in a bit about what happened since. There are now two lawsuits going through the works, supposedly. One is from the family of the woman he probably unalived. They're, they are saying the police failed to apprehend him before she got unalived. That lists all the police departments and cities involved. Wow. Wow. The other is from his family going after the sheriff's department and county, which chased him and led to the crash. I doubt I have to testify as the lawyer was mainly concerned about the specific events leading to me knowing it was my old boss who stole my identity. It sounds to me like everyone is going for settlement money. Just figured I'd let everybody know what happened. Too long, don't read. He won't be stealing anyone else's identity anymore. Let's talk about the status of San Luis Obispo. After two college students are abducted and finished without a trace or any leads, a parole officer pays a visit to a parolee that has a grisly criminal history. Out of more than 100 ex-cons in his caseload, David Saragosa remembered that Rex Allen Krebs has a criminal history that is unlike any other. Specifically, the violence against women, where 12 years earlier, Krebs had broken into a Pismo Beach homes of two women repeatedly and terrorized them. In 1987, Shelley Crosby left a restaurant and walked past Krebs, who tried to get her attention. When she ignored him, he decided to follow her home in his Volkswagen. The 21-year-old divorced mother returned to an empty house as the kids were at the sitters and her roommate was gone until the next morning. He waited almost an hour for her to go to bed and then broke into her home. She woke up to his hand across her mouth and a weapon pressed against her throat. He tied her up and assaulted her repeatedly until he heard the muffler of her roommate's car coming home. Then he leaned over next to her and whispered, have a nice day, before fleeing the premises. Three weeks later, he would strike again against a 31-year-old single mother asleep in her Pismo Beach home next to her 7-year-old daughter. She was awoken by a crash and found herself face-to-face -face with Krebs, who placed a screwdriver to the edge of her eye. Her daughter screamed, and Anishka Constantine offered him money, jewelry, whatever he wanted, but he said, I want you. Anishka told her daughter to hide under the bed. She found a phone and attempted to call 911, but the phone was dead. When he was unzipping his pants, Anishka noticed that he had a knife at his waist. She asked him to go to another room, and as they were walking down the hallway, she managed to knock the knife out of his belt and onto the floor. They struggled and she attempted to stab him, but unfortunately, his belt buckle deflected it. Enraged, he repeatedly bashed her head into the wall, but despite her injuries, she was able to flee. She screamed for her neighbors and Krebs fled the scene leaving behind a brown corduroy snap brim hat, a buck knife, and a sheet. Both Anishka and her daughter positively identified him in a lineup and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison after agreeing to a plea bargain. He unfortunately only served 10 of those years and was let out on parole, which would be the biggest mistake as he would continue the rampage but in a deadly way. A year after Krebs was released on the night of November 12, 1998, a college student named Rachel Newhouse was walking home when a stranger appeared wearing a skull face Halloween mask. She tried to go around him but he wouldn't let her and then he started to beat her unconscious with his fists. Then he throws her into the back of his pickup truck, took her to a secluded canyon cabin where he assaulted her while wearing the mask. He then hogtied her and stuffed her underwear into her mouth. When he got back, she was dead. That's when he buries her body in a shallow grave. The next day, Rachel fails to show up to the brewery that she worked at and her roommates called the police. The San Luis Obispo police didn't have much to go on other than a bloodstain on the bridge which was tested and positively matched her DNA. There were no eyewitnesses at this time and no body so the case stalled until his second victim. On March 11, 1999, just five months later in the same town, another young woman is abducted. Andrea Crawford was only 20 years old and a couple weeks before her abduction, she had asked her neighbors if they'd seen a man creeping around in their shared backyard. According to her neighbors, Andrea wore strong glasses due to farsightedness. She couldn't see up close, which is relevant to the story. Rex Allen Krebs forced himself through her small window, even breaking two ribs to do so. Her bedroom was upstairs. In the dead of night, he crept up and pummeled her into insensibility. From there, he carried her to his truck but stopped along the way to grab her keys as a trophy. 
and then he took her to the same cabin where he repeatedly assaulted and tortured her. During this, he was drinking heavily and continued to assault her through the remainder of the night. After he passed out, she attempted to escape and made it to the front door. However, due to her bad eyesight, she couldn't really see how to manipulate the locks. The noise unfortunately woke him up and he grabbed her as she was moments from escaping. He murdered her and buried her in a shallow grave in the yard next to his previous victim. The next day, Andrea's mother couldn't get a hold of her and called the police. They dispatched police to search Andrea's duplex and found her purse inside her car which remained in the driveway. At first, police announced that they didn't feel like the two missing women's cases were related, but Rachel's uncle, Peter Morial, who happened to be a DA in Riverside, went public and stressed the similarities between Andrea and Rachel. Both women were attending colleges nearby, both had similar physiques, and both disappeared without a trace. He felt that a serial killer was operating in the area. Krebs's parole officer, David Saragossa, had the same hunch and decided to give Krebs a visit. He noticed that Krebs was in pain. He was wearing a weightlifter's belt and stated that he had injured himself by falling on a pile of wood. But Saragossa wasn't buying it and pushed the investigation. Karen Sandusky ran the Justice Department's sexual predator unit and gave Krebs a visit that night. During a search, they didn't find anything related to the missing girls, but they found BBs. Krebs admitted to keeping a BB gun at the lumber yard where he worked. Possession of any firearm, real or simulated, is a violation of parole. They staked his job the next morning, found the BB gun, and arrested him. Then they thoroughly searched his home, where they found Andrea's 8-ball keychain that Krebs had taken as a trophy. On April 22, 1999, he was questioned and waived his constitutional rights. They asked if he was responsible for the two women's disappearances, and he shook his head yes. He later showed investigators where he disposed of their bodies. He stated at one point, If I'm not a monster, then what am I? The jury answered this question after deliberating for four days during his trial and found him guilty on 11 counts. He was sentenced to death on May 11, 2001. He's on death row at California San Quentin State Prison. A date has not been scheduled for his execution. Here are just some accidental toxic things that I've done while dealing with the new man I'm seeing and he's like really healthy. Like I'm toxic to my core, so I'm learning to be healthy, but I do have my moments and here are some of my moments. I'm sharing these so we can all learn together because maybe someone out there also needs the help. And like in the moment, I'm like, that's not even toxic. First thing I did, I had an event and he knew about the event and it was like, I was wearing a gown. I looked gorgeous, all these things. And he was like, hey, send me, send me a photo of you like in your fit when you're all ready. I told this man, I said, go check my Instagram. Like that was just so unnecessarily rude for, in my fucking defense though, I was running around and I was busy. And then, but also I won't lie. In my head, I'm like, that's not my fucking man. Like, yeah, I'm seeing him, but that's not my fucking man. Like, does he really deserve a photo of me? Like the toxic crazy bitch really came out and I was like, he really thinks I'm gonna just send him fucking photos of myself. Yeah, yeah right. Um, what? My crazy ass is like, I did nothing wrong. Like I did actually nothing wrong. But then after further evaluation, I was like, oh, I don't think that was my nicest moment. And he communicated with me and was like, hey, I felt very dismissed in that moment. I just wanted to see a photo. And it was just kind of a little bit disrespectful for you to be like, go check my Instagram. I hate to admit that he was right. I'm learning. That was a learning curve for me. I'm learning to not be a bitch too. It's, I'm a hyper independent, woman for number one like I'm so like I don't need a man I don't need a man and then he's just like in the corner like okay girl like whatever I'm learning those toxic patterns is pretty fucking difficult oh and the next one like this is really fucking embarrassing like I'm not gonna this is really embarrassing just a little backstory I know the man that I'm currently seeing I've known him for like eight months I just kind of ignored him. Like I fully ghosted that motherfucker several times. Like he was just trying to get to know me and like I just genuinely would not answer. That means he's been following my Instagram for that long. And let me tell you something. You think I'm a crazy bitch here? No, I'm a crazy fucking bitch on Instagram. But one day, a couple months ago, before I was even seeing this man, before I was even seeing this man, I made one of my best friend's boyfriend, we were like, uh, basically, okay, this is like so fucking stupid. Like basically I soft launched the fuck. <laughs> out of my best friend's boyfriend because like we just thought it was funny no i wanted to make a fucking man jealous there was a different man i wanted to make him jealous and i would think let me just like soft launch one of my best friend's boyfriends obviously we're all in it together like they love the shenanigans and i wrote on this I, i'll put i'll repost it to my instagram story now but it was like soft launch or am i psychotic whatever it, the answer was i'm just psychotic i fully soft launched one of my best friend's boyfriend thinking i ate thinking i like did the damn thing right then i deleted it probably 15 minutes later because i was like what the fuck is wrong with me whatever two months go by i'm at a little beach picnic with new mans and he was like hey can i just ask you something and i'm like yeah he was like were you <laughs> It was like, were you seeing somebody a couple months ago? Because like, I saw that you posted another man on your Instagram story. So I was just like wondering what the correlation was like when we weren't talking and like, are you still seeing that man? My 
best friend's fucking boyfriend. If you had told me in the moment while I was soft launching my friend's boyfriend just for the fucking fun of it, that it would come up later in conversation, I would have never done it. But my toxic ass just like likes to just fuck around. And I wanted to make a man who really didn't care if I lived or died jealous. Now I have to explain to new man that I'm just bat shit. Cause the thing is, it's like, I could have lied. And like, if you guys remember the last story I told you about me lying to new man, it didn't go well. And like, I was like, you know what? I'll just be dead fucking honest. So I had to swallow my motherfucking pride. But more importantly, I had to swallow my lying tendencies, which I would have normally, I'm not gonna lie. I would have normally lied my ass out of that. Like, yeah, we dated. No, I called my best friend's boyfriend up and I said, hey. <laughs> You guys want to explain to new man right now, like what our thought process was on that one? They were like, Livy, that was literally all you. I'm like, let's not focus on who it was or whose idea it was, whatever. And luckily new man was like laughing and giggling. He was, <laughs> it was just painful. It's painful to not lie in those situations. I'm not gonna, whatever, I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I could easily just been like, yep, it was a man I was saying, but I was like, let me be honest. Those are just some low key toxic things that I'm trying to unlearn. You bitch, it's a journey. I have to earn, unlearn. I have to unlearn like seven fucking years. Am I wrong for being glad that my future sister-in-law had a miscarriage before my wedding? I know this sounds very bad, but hear me out. I, 24 male, and my fiance, 22 female, are planning to get married this summer. Now, one of her bridesmaids is her sister, 27 female, who planned to attend our wedding while seven months pregnant. I obviously didn't like that as I figured that her pregnancy would steal attention from us especially as she's one of the bridesmaids. And she's honestly such an attention seeker that I wouldn't put it past her to have gotten pregnant purposefully before our wedding in order to upstage us. But there was no way I couldn't have excluded her from the wedding as she's my fiance sister. So I just dropped it. I don't think I need to read past the title for this one. However, she recently had a miscarriage and while I felt really sorry for her, I was also kind of glad about it because now she wouldn't be able to upstage us at our wedding. My fiance took me with her to visit her sister in order to console her and there I said, well, you should see the glass half full now. At least you can wear a smaller bridesmaid dress at our wedding. My fiance glared at me, then her sister said, is your wedding the only thing you f care about? I tried to de-escalate the situation, but she just kept unloading on me about how much a sadistic narcissistic I am and when I've had enough, I told her, well, I'm sorry that your failed pregnancy won't allow you to upstage us at our wedding anymore, which made her burst into tears. My fiance tried to calm her down, but my future sister-in-law just told us to get out of her house, which we did. All hell broke loose at my home when my fiance started scolding me about how I could be so insensible to her sister's recent trauma. But I told her that she was the one who started to insult me over an inoffensive remark meant to cheer her up. We've had a big argument about it and now I'm sleeping in the guest room. She's still very bitter about it and says that she doesn't know if she'll be able to go through with the wedding if her sister decides to drop out of it because of me. I think she's overreacting about the whole situation as her sister would probably stir up some trouble at the wedding anyway but maybe I should have indeed handled the situation with her miscarriage better than how I did. So, am I the asshole? My gold digging mom called my fiance cheap and stingy. Story time. So my fiance Steve recently proposed to me. It was literally so romantic, like the perfect proposal. We knew from like the first few weeks that we would end up spending the rest of our life together. But there is just one little issue. The first time my mom met Steve, she turned around to me and was like, I thought you said he was well off. She was looking at his car. She goes, that car is a load of rubbish. What you should know about Steve is he is a car guy. He earns a hell of a lot of money and he buys cars. But he decided to just pick a comfortable car that day because he didn't want to seem showy offy. So Steve did not react at all. He actually became way more polite. So we actually had dinner that night and um, my mom the whole time kept commenting on how Steve's looks weren't his strong point. And it was really fucking us off. As soon as we got in that car, I could not stop apologizing. He was so understanding. He said, I know that your mom's words aren't a reflection on you. Now I was hoping that this would kind of be like an intimidation tactic from my mom, but you know. Every single time we went over, my mom would dig Steve. She would say every single time we went over that my daughter's only dating you for your money. She doesn't actually like you because you don't have a personality. And after several months, it actually turned into Steve and my mom getting into arguments. One time he turned around and was like, I could burn all of my money and your daughter would still love me. Anyway, so last month Steve proposed when we were in Switzerland. It was such a romantic getaway. It was literally perfection. We were watching the sunset over the mountains and he got down on one knee. 
We'd previously spoken about what type of ring I would like. And when I tell you this boy, he nailed it. Like the ring was an exact match of what I had asked for. We literally spent the rest of the trip talking about our future together and how excited we were planning our life. When we got home, I just wanted to tell everyone. I wanted to tell my mom. I wanted to tell my dad. I wanted to tell all my friends. I wanted to tell the world. So I showed them. They were really complimentary. They seemed really happy for me. I'd started looking into dresses. And then literally out of nowhere, my mum posted this really disgusting thing on Facebook. She said that my wedding ring was disgraceful. She said it probably cost less than her entire wardrobe altogether. She said it was tacky. She said that the diamond looked like a small stone that he just picked up off the ground. She went on saying that my partner was a cheap man and that he never did anything nice for me. She said how he just spends all of his money on himself and spends nothing on his girl. So after this, we decided that my mum would not be coming to our wedding. We actually got married last week in a ceremony with just me and Steve, and it was literally perfect. Am I the asshole for telling my wife to return it all? My pregnant wife, 26 female, and I, 35 male, are really struggling at the moment as I lost my job and my wife had to quit her job as she's suffering from hypermesis gravidarium. We've used up our savings and currently are living off of our credit cards, but I've got a job lined starting in March. My wife is very close to her sister, 31 female, and a few days ago, she confided in her that we are struggling. Her sister has never liked me, but has always been polite to me. She has always kept me at arm length despite my attempts at trying to foster a warmer relationship. A few days ago, my sister-in-law came to visit while I was away and she was appalled at the state of the house and the lack of baby supplies, as the baby room was bare bones and we hadn't bought many baby things. When I arrived back home, she had given me a lecture on taking better care of her sister and scolded me for not getting ready for the baby. The next day, she came back and she had bought things for the house and the baby. My wife also told her that we had to sell her car to pay off some of the bills and rent. Again, my sister-in-law law had to show off that she bought her a car and to top it off on Sunday she sent her 50k and then texted her this in quotes this is your money and your babies do not use it on that man if you need more tell me and I'll send more and remember wherever I am there's a home for you I feel like her sister is trying to make me look like a failure and I expressed that to my wife my wife and I argued and in a fit of anger my wife said that I only feel like a failure because I've been failing she has apologized since but I still stand by telling her to return everything as I feel like accepting her sister's so-called generosity is a way to manipulate my wife into thinking I'm a bad husband. My new wife got me into $130,000 of debt. What should I do? This is a 30-year-old man and I was single, but I was desperate for a wife. My best friend lives in Montenegro and he says that the women there are beautiful. I decided to go visit him and just meet some girls. This is when I met my current wife. Best friend took me to this party and there were like 20 women there. All beautiful, all amazing, but my wife stuck out to me because she came up to me first. We had a great time talking. At the end of the night, my best friend tells me that this party was for men to go meet women. Essentially, men with money go meet women and then they marry them. Then the women go back to wherever the men live. It sounds Sounds terrible, right? But I was desperate. All my siblings are married and have kids, and I still didn't even have a girlfriend. And the biggest part of this is I was set to inherit money once I got married. My aunt had left me $70,000, and my parents told me that that money would come to me when I got married. Essentially, that money would serve as a down payment for a house or something. But like I said, I was desperate. After three days of hanging out with this woman, I asked her to marry me, because that's how it's supposed to go. We get back to where I live and fast forward two months. She just goes shopping every single day. She doesn't just go shopping to the mall. She shops online. Essentially, she got herself a whole new wardrobe, not just any wardrobe. She's obsessed with Balenciaga for some reason. I don't even know what that is. She got herself a Louis Vuitton purse. She asked me for a car, which I did get her one because she actually did need one. Got to dinner at least once a week and she wanted me to take her on vacation. Spent $25,000 taking her to the Bahamas. Essentially, I gave her everything she wanted. When my parents realized what was happening, they said that they would not give me the inheritance if I married this woman. Even my siblings tried to talk me out of marrying her. But this is when I was really faced with the truth. My accountant calls me one day and asked me, if I'm okay. That's when he breaks it to me that I'm more than $130,000 in debt. And when I told him why, he told me that I needed to break up with her immediately. To be honest, I don't know what to do though. I mean, our relationship is pretty good and I don't have any other prospects, but I really need that money I'm supposed to inherit. My family thinks I'm crazy for doing what I'm doing, but I actually can't afford to have this relationship. This is when I told my fiance that she needed to spend less money. She threatened to break up with me and told me that that's not what she signed up for and that she could find any other man to give her the lifestyle she needs. I was ready to break up with her, but when she said this, I felt insecure and I wanted to be with her even more. So we went to the court and got married the next day. Am I being completely played? Am I really that dumb? Family say they won't speak to me until I get a divorce. She still goes shopping every day. What should I do? Self-care sister out.